Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk with professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their lives in and outside of the ring, as well as doing active charity work, community service, volunteering, and spreading positivity. We're always about the positivity here on the show, and with me right now, I've got a very special guest. He is the founder of ECW, Extreme Championship Wrestling. Pleased to welcome the one, the only, Todd Gordon. Welcome, Todd, to Wrestling With Heart. Thank you, Stanley. Pleasure to be here. Yes. So let's talk about your upbringing and childhood. Where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia area, suburb of Philadelphia. Okay. That's where ECW began. Everything came out of Philadelphia. It's a big city. I was there for WrestleMania. Oh. Uh, yes. Yes. Did you make it to WrestleCon? Yep. Yeah, I was... I was there. We were there. It was myself, Sam Man, and Two Cold Scorpio and Jerry Lynn were together for that. Nice. I mean, Philadelphia's got that strong wrestling following. Great wrestling town. Uh, fans love ECW. They love the product. And you guys put your hard work in, into it. And it's exciting and so amazing to see all these years later, people still remember it. So that's very awesome. It, it's an absurd way to remember it. It's still chanted 30 years later. It's astounding to me. It's incredible. Really is. Philadelphia, okay. Was wrestling something you grew up watching as a kid? I became addicted to wrestling from the time I was maybe six years old. I caught it on UHF television, which is like, you know, we had the regular three channels. Uh, then we had UHF, and it was on UHF on Saturdays. Back then, it was the WWF. And from the first time I saw it, I was absolutely hooked. I loved it. And loved it my entire life. Never stopped loving it. Man, it's amazing. You know, I think I've heard the expression used, you know, they hook you from childhood and you're a fan for life afterwards. So who were some of your favorites growing up? Wow, that's a good question. First of all, of the obvious one was Bruno San Martino because he was champion for like 10 years while I was growing up. <clears throat> Beyond that, be, I liked a lot of the bad guys. Uh, like superstar Billy Graham and Killer Kowalski, Crazy Luke Graham and Bulldog Brower. And th those are the kind of guys I really love. And of course, some of the good guys, like T.J. Strongbow was a favorite. Uh, but yeah, the old Jimmy Valiant, when, and the, even before he became part of the Valiant Brothers, who was handsome Jimmy Valiant. And he was a baby face. And I just always loved it. What was it about some of those guys that made you go, man, I want to enter in the business? Well, that didn't make me want to enter the business so much as I just love the entertainment value of it. I found myself able to believe what I was seeing, which is a thread that ends up going right through ECW. Back then, everything I saw was believable. There was no, you know, junk being done in there. Or they weren't kidding around and making, you know, jokes and trying to be cartoon characters. They were really, it looked so snug. Every time Bruno threw a punch or a kick, I thought he was really punching and kicking him. Now, granted, I'm looking at it through a nine years old or 10 year old's eyes, but it was believable. And the reason I started ECW is everything at that point was unbelievable. As I tell people that I, I was done the day the Ultimate Warrior was against Papa Shango. Papa Shango was on one side of the arena waving some kind of spell. And across the arena, the Ultimate Warrior started to throw up from this. And I said, that's it. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hated mm. it. They're making me hate something that I loved. And when I started our product, my whole goal always was to do something that was believable. Make the fans believe it's real. So we made it real. And those guys went out and hit each other with chairs or they went out and beat the hell out of each other all through the building. It was real. I mean, there was no, you know, no game about it. There was no joke. I mean, if you were in that audience and you saw them coming towards you, you knew they were hitting each other. You were two feet away and they did not try to like pull anything. They were real. There was real fighting. There was real believability. There were real people in the ring. They weren't characters. There wasn't a dumpster guy. There wasn't a race car guy. These are real people, really, real feuds, and real storylines. And it's crazy, you know, ECW was really <clears throat> innovative with 
coming up with that reality based programming and content that you didn't really see in the WWE or the WCW NWA in years prior, because this was something new. And I think it really caught the audience's attention as you've seen, as a lot of people have seen fans have seen for years. Well, to tell you the truth, at that very same time I started ECW, WWF had a cartoon show on Saturday mornings. You couldn't get more extreme than going from a cartoon show to a barbed wire match. I mean, it was like, that's... that's Night perfect. and day difference. Yeah. And people wanted that again. And it was obvious because of the way it caught on and started to roll like a snowball down a hill and it getting bigger and bigger and bigger, faster than I could keep up with it. It just took off. Rock, it was like uh, you know, a rock in a bottle kind of thing. It was crazy. Definitely was. What can you tell me about when you first started ECW, the promotion? What Was there like something that made you go, okay, I want to start my own promotion. How do I go about doing it? Not exactly. I was actually, uh, there was a guy named Joel Goodhart who had a promotion called Tri-State Wrestling Alliance. And he would run shows in the Philadelphia area. And he had a radio show on mainstream radio and at that time uh, the early late 80s early 90s wrestling wasn't even talked about in mainstream like, people it was like looked down upon so being a fan and see, hearing it on the radio i was going to dig into his show i got to know joel i ended up advertising on his show got my foot in the door that way uh then he had a thing where you offer wrestlers a chance to you a chance for a wrestler to appear in your business you'd have them come out for personal appearances which they didn't ever do back then, really. I love the idea. He said, I can get you anybody. You know, you want Greg Valentine, Tito Santana. Pick somebody. You got it. I said, who else do you got? He said, oh, I got Ric Flair. I said, I know who I want. He said, who? He said, Missy Hyatt. He said, Missy Hyatt? That's who you're picking? And I went, yeah. You know, I'm like 30, 30 years old. Yeah, I'm picking Missy Hyatt. And sure enough, she came down to the store in a personal appearance. And then uh, Joel brought me in as a, as a partner in his business, which unfortunately did not succeed. And then from there, I thought, okay, well, I gave it a shot. At least I could be part of it for, for a short time. And then three of the people who worked with him, ring announcer Bob Ortiz, uh, an independent worker named Larry Winters, a music guy named Steve True, who all worked with Joel, approached me one day in my office and said, listen, we want to keep doing this. Is there any, but none of us can get a bond. Would you consider getting a promoter's license and a bond and keeping the show going. Well, I had learned from Joel in that short time what was good and what was bad. He, you know, what not to spend money on and what to spend money on. I, was, I saw where he had made the mistakes. I said, all right, well, we're just doing small little bar shows, you know, for 100 people. How, how big of a risk is that? It wasn't much of a risk at all. So that's what we started doing. I did not think that a year and a half later I'd be on pay-per-view and national TV. Not my goal at the time. It just took, like I said, it took off and people would not let it stop. It's getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, definitely caught on, gained There's a, a hunger. following. Yeah. There's a hunger for something new, something something believable. It's really that's really the key word there, is believability. Yeah, it's that suspense of disbelief. You want to have <clears> that <throat> illusion and imagination in your mind that somebody's getting hit with a chair, somebody's bleeding for Except whatever, you know. It wasn't an illusion. These guys were getting hit with those chairs. You went in that dressing room after a show, it was like a mass shooter back there. Yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with all these people, you know, they really want it bad enough to be in the wrestling business, and they give it their all, blood, sweat, and tears, literally even. That's the sacrifice. True. And a lot of those guys, that's how they got to where they were. People like the Sandman or Public Enemy, no one had ever heard of them. And, you know, between Paul Heyman and myself, we made them into stars. And they became stars. And the key to doing that was using the best people to get them over. Uh, my mainstay, of course, was Terry Funk. Terry Funk made, meant more to promotion than anybody who ever came to the doors. Without him, we never would have gotten to the levels we got to. He had the credibility, he had the believability, and he was known as a hardcore wrestler. And he single-handedly elevated Sabu through a program with him. He elevated the public enemy when he and his brother worked tag teams against them. He elevated Shane Douglas. He made Shane Douglas. Without Terry, none of those guys would ever probably have ever been anything the way they are now. He really did single-handedly help every one of those guys become bigger and become main events on their own in addition to himself. 
so generous, such a great human being, too. What can you tell me about the first night ECW ran? First show ever done. The first show ever done, again, was a bar show. It was a Tuesday night, like 8 o'clock at night for maybe 100 people. It was, it was exciting for me because now I'm running a show instead of like being a ring announcer or whatever I did with Joel. And uh, you know, it wasn't a great show by any stretch of the imagination, but some of those guys were hardcore guys and they would go on to continue with East, Eastern at the time called Eastern became extreme in ECW. So there's nothing really so memorable that that would stand out. But as we grew and got in a bigger building that had real crowds and real, real people who would come off of television like Morocco and Snooka, you know, big names started coming in. And then more and more big names wanted to come in. Uh, my very first show that we had Ivan Koloff come in. And he was the only, only named person on the show. And what a great, great teacher he was. I was very fortunate that I surrounded myself with the right kind of guys early on who guided me and helped me. Otherwise, I was probably going to shoot up and spit out. I mean, that you can be taken advantage of so easily in this industry. It's insane. But I had really honest guys there. I was such a gentleman. Terry, these guys really want, and Snuka, they all wanted the company to succeed. They, they, they believed in it. They believed in my vision of it. And they were, we just, you know, hit it off together. And without them, who knows where I would have ended up. But they guided me along the way so that I would not be, you know, chewed up and spit out, so to speak. What can you tell me about the first meeting you had with Paul Heyman? How did you guys meet? Well, Ed, I brought in Eddie Gilbert to my booker. Eddie Gilbert was, you know, a well-known wrestler and also a well-known booker. He had done it for years. He and Paul were very friendly. And when we first of our TV taping, he brought Paul in to help out and become a manager and work for, for the promotion. That was the first time I met Paul. Um, you know, we didn't have much to say to each other. You know, hey, nice to meet you, that kind of thing. And little by little as we grew, we spent more time together. You know, then we got to know each other much, much, much better. We became like best of friends. Uh, we were like inseparable there for a while. Uh, one of the first meetings meetings I had with him was in Eddie Gilbert's hotel room after one of our big arena shows. And Paul was in there with him. He came in and goes, I like you. I think we'll keep you. He went, okay. And he was like 10 years younger than I was, but okay. Uh, and that was really how we got to meet each other, get to know each other. From there, it was just a matter of phone calls. And, and as it went on and on until Eddie was no longer with us as a booker. And uh, I gave Paul that job. And he did, he, you know, the both of you really worked well together. We did. And he did. He had his finger on the pulse of things that I had nowhere near my finger on. Mostly the, the music, the uh, you know, the grunge. He had his finger on the pulse of what was happening with young people at that time who were hip and they were down with the rest of the kind of product we had. And the music videos that he did. I mean, he really was so far ahead of his time. It was amazing. Well, I think when you talk about music videos, I think Memphis Wrestling was like one of the first promotions to really do that. And then its influence kind of spread out to the main mainstream. But me, I'm reminding you the entrance music. The songs that he gave each guy were, you know, songs of that time. They were hip songs. Uh, the Memphis music was more like, you know, classic rock, which is probably what I would have done if I was by myself. You know, like that's the kind of music we listen to. But Paul again had his finger on the pulse of what was going on, you know, with with the youth that generation, and he was terrific at it. Yeah, I mean, ECW, like you just mentioned, it was very punk rock, grunge esque to what WWE was doing. It was more pop, WCW, more you know, more pop it, pop and rock kind of feel. Uh, but ECW was this underground promotion that was getting this just real cult following. And, you know, you and Paul were able to take that and run with it and, and look at what look at what ECW became, just this powerhouse of, a, of an organization, produced some of the most amazing talents and matches that people still talk about. Which to me is like, it's, a, it's amazing to me that's even the case. I mean, even now, I look back and I say, how did that happen? How did we catch that lightning in the bubble? Like, what was that? I'll never forget the first time we did a big show. And back then, we sold VHS tapes. That's what there was. You mm -hmm. know, you're put them in the v, VCR, and that's how you watched it. And we got an order for, like, six tapes from Japan. I said, Japan? 
How do they know about us in Japan? They barely know us in New Jersey. <laughs> it's true. But it turns out there, there's something called tape traders back then. And they would trade tapes and hardcore fans with the people they knew in Japan back and forth. And all of a sudden, we're getting tape words like by the score from Japan. As many as were the states, it was crazy because they love that kind of product. And the thing is, is like ECW was like the first to really welcome guys like Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio to the forefront. The luchador scene and the cruiserweights were like huge and blew up big in the states because of ECW, and then it made its way to the other organizations later yeah, on. Of course, they saw something we did was successful. So naturally, the first thing they're trying to do is grab those guys and. Now they're going to go with it. at that time. And the guys like Eddie Guerrero and I oh, even say Chris Benoit. I hate saying the name and Dean Malenko. Guys like that wouldn't have sniffed a chance of even being like a lower card guy on the WWF show when they saw the success we had with these guys. That you don't have to be a six foot ten inch giant to get over and wow the crowd, so to speak. They went after them at one point. Don't forget. Guerrero and Benoit both were champions there at the same time. Mm-hmm. Guys, they wouldn't even let in the Federation prior to that. Ray Mysterio became a champion. No one even heard of Ray Mysterio until we used him. So that that was that was really important. Jerry Lynn, Chris Benoit. I mean, not Chris Benoit, I'm sorry, Chris Jericho. I mean, all those guys, you know, they weren't big, but they were great. It was a matter of knowing who, what talent looked like instead of looking at a physique or bodybuilder, who was recognizing talent and letting them do their thing. Yeah, ECW really set the bar for what talent could be like, as we see now with the likes of CM Punk and Brian Danielson and guys like that that are really, you know, in the modern era. Would never have gotten a shot had not those other guys preceded them back when we were doing it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Kevin he- Sullivan got it. That's why he started grabbing all of our guys. Kevin really, he loved our product. If he could have made the money he made in WCW with us, he never would have left. He would have loved to have been the booker here, believe me. Do you do you still keep up with the modern product? I don't keep up with it, you know, you know because there's so many hours on a week. That's part of the problem. You watch wrestling now six nights a week. It's insane. <clears throat> I, I keep up with the, the WWE more than I keep up with the other products. I really have not seen a lot of AEW. I started to watch it you know, a little while, a couple of years ago, I didn't like the product. I liked mm. some of the guys in there, but I didn't like the product. I didn't like the whole, it looked like acrobats trying to, you know, bounce and you know, do triple flips, and which is all fine, done in the right way. But these guys were doing it, and they do a spot that should have been a finish to a match. Jump back up, and do three more in a row. I, I said, what is that? How are you going to believe that was real when the guy jumped right back up again? You're going to do a triple flip off the ladder on the floor, that's got to be the end there. Instead of like a quarter of a way through the match. And that turned me off to that product, to be honest with you. I've read your book, and it's really good. Thank you. You're welcome. What made you decide to to write Todd as God? Honestly, I didn't have any intention of writing a book. The gentleman who co-wrote it with me, uh, he said to me, you've got to write this book. You've got to tell the story. Everybody only knows that it's Paul Heyman's ECW. It's like he wrote you out of the history of the business. I said, yeah, but my ego's not like that. I'm not, there's been 30, 20-something years now. If I was sitting up to now, why bother now? He's busy, you're entitled. He can push me and push me. You just tell the true story. Let the people know what really happened and how it happened, what your role was, what his real, just tell the truth. And I did. I wrote the book. And I said, I've not talked to him since then. So, so it'll be interesting. Every single thing that came out about ECW, the rise and fall of ECW, the history, everyone had a catchphrase underneath it, the unauthorized version. Well, of course, I wasn't even contacted by any of those people who did those projects, not once. Hmm. Not even asked a question. Nothing. So I said, how about I write a book? I'll call it the authorized version. It's just the truth. I was there. I don't have to call it the unauthorized version. I can actually say what really happened. So people were saying, only what the people who work for WWE told them. I mean, all these projects only involved, you know, Tommy Dreamer, Taz, Dudley, Paul, the guys who were with WWE. But they never knew Shane Douglas. No, they never knew Joey Styles. They never knew uh, me. 
I mean, it was a sad man. I mean, come on. Uh, you can't say this is a true story what happened with ECW without talking to any of the principals. Right. And that's what they did. So I said, he, all right, I, uh, he broke me down. Sean Oliver, you got it. We'll do the book. But it's got to be called the authorized version. And it was. Yeah. I think it's really fascinating. I love reading it. And I highly recommend people listening and watching this podcast to check it out. It's a really good read, really good book. Outside of wrestling, what kinds of charity groups or organizations have you worked with or have done any kind of philanthropy outside the business that you can talk to me about? Yeah, there's an organization called the Variety Club. Now it's called the Variety Children's Organization where it started out where we provided prosthetics, wheelchairs, uh, things like that for kids who couldn't afford them. For kids who like you know needed a wheelchair, they couldn't afford a wheelchair, couldn't afford a, a prosthetic leg. And actually, when I first started ECW, had I known how big it was going to get, I, I don't know that I would have done it at the time. I was the president of the Variety Club. Here, I was a Pennsylvania cha- Philadelphia chapter. I mean, it's an international charity. Uh, you know, oh yeah, there's cha- tents and chapters everywhere. Uh, so it was a full, that was like a full-time job, and this is another full-time job. So I was doing that, and I was president of the charity prior to that, you know, executive board member, and very involved in that. In fact, before I, again, before I ever met Paul or Eddie or any of these guys, I moved to the, moved the a developmental center in the camp for the kids, which is a this great facility where during the summer, two weeks out of the summer, these parents would take care of these kids 24-7, you know, all your every day of their lives, they get a two week respite. Hmm. And the camp was for these kids to come for two weeks and be campers and especially trained people who took care of them and gave the parents that two week break a year. It was uh, it's an unbelievable organization. It's very very heartwarming. It's touching. It's phenomenal. Um, and we went out there. We put on free shows for them. I took out Sam Man and Tommy Cairo and their early Eastern guys, JT Smith, and they loved it. They love going out there to that camp with all the kids in their wheelchairs with different disabilities that they had and performing for them. You know, it's a different kind of audience, obviously. So we'll get a hardcore in front of that all. But it was so, it meant so much to these kids. And I love the fact these guys wanted to do it with me. So we would go out there and put on shows. And as I said, I was a very, it, it was an integral part of my life, that whole organization. I spent many years there. Working my way up the ladder from you know a board member to you know, treasurer, vice president, president, eventually became the president and chairman of the board, and then I also moved on. <coughs> but my life would have been so different without that. I, I can't imagine not having that to humble me and keep me, you know, real and level headed. Definitely seems very interesting to create like different kinds of wheelchairs and helping kids that are that are having these struggles and are going through stuff. Because you just never know, you know, what they're going through in their lives. No one, no one could appreciate it. I couldn't appreciate it. I mean, there's was one kid, Stevie Cobra, bring up his name. He's uh, in a wheelchair still to this day. It's thirty years ago, and he had he was like at the time five, six. He'd had thirteen or fourteen surgeries already, and he was only six. I mean, big surgeries. Now he's going to have maybe twenty something. But I did a convention in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, two years ago. And doesn't he come rolling up? He's like, oh, my God, Uncle Todd, Uncle Todd. I was like, oh, he, he, he goes, I'll never forget. He let me have come to the shows at the arena. And he gave me these tickets and put me in a special box. They were scared of all the rest. He said, and I, I'll never forget. I love you so much. And I said, oh, my God. I got emotional was talking about it. So all these years later, that impacted these kids to the point where he wanted to come out to this convention. He lives within an hour's drive or whatever just to say hello and meet me, see me again. That's so heartwarming, it is. you know, and, and how long, and how long ago in between when he went to the show versus when you saw him again, all these years later? Well, you know, I guess 25 years. Yeah. I mean, occasionally on Facebook, he would reach out and say, you know, how are you? And stuff like that. Say, how are you? And my, I had two kids who were, I had one, two, kids, two of my kids well, was, were his age. And I used to bring them to the, you know, functions and they used to push him around in the wheelchair, and they used to, it was trying to let them know how how lucky they were. And I felt lucky that kids were healthy, and I wanted them to know that too. 
and to this day, he said, how's Allie? How's he? And he, he remembered the girls. And it was like, this, it was just, like I said, it was one of those things you just never lose, you never forget. Yeah. Why do you feel passionate about giving back to your community? Because I was fortunate. I had kids who were all healthy. I saw these other kids who didn't want to be like that, but they had no choice. They were born that way. And, you know, they didn't ask for that. My kids were blessed. I was blessed to have kids that had no health issues like that. And to see the love and the affection these people have with their own families and how much those parents do and put up with and had to go through. I mean, it's a, when I say a full time job, they, they got the full-time jobs. They're doing 24 hours a day. You know, they're giving up everything so these kids can afford them more surgeries and, and be able to be any kind of an active role in society. It's, you couldn't help but meet these people and not be, not, and not be like, you know, in awe of them. They were, because they were all got great attitudes. They were walking around like, oh, woe was me, look at me, look at me. But they had every right to. So I admired those kids. I was thrilled to get back to them. I have something to do with their success. Well, Todd, this has been wonderful getting the chance to speak with you. It means a thank lot you. to me and, and to my listeners and viewers. I want to say thank you for coming on to the show. Uh, where can people find more about you on social media if they want to buy your book or get in touch? The only, with you? Social, the only social media I really am on is Facebook. Uh, I'm older than most, most everybody else. I guess I didn't have the same, you know, opportunities or whatever. Like I'm not on Instagram or uh, TikTok or whatever, and uh, Facebook's as far as I got, <laughs> and that was like pulling teeth for me. I mean, my email address is at aol.com. My kids call it say 1990.com. Uh, yeah, same thing, whatever. So <clears throat> that's where I can be reached um, anytime. As far as the book, Amazon, you can get any bookstore or go to Amazon and get the book there or the audio recording of it, which is also really good. I'm not throwing the way it went. I'm thrilled with the love I get everywhere I go. It makes me feel like a million dollars. I appreciate you having me on. It was really cool. Absolutely. And love to meet you in person as well. Ditto. All right. Thanks again. Take care. And you're more than welcome to come back. My pleasure. All right. Take care. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.